All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to create a parametric pendant lamp in Grasshopper. With just one script, we can generate the variations you see here. We'll start with some circles, turn them into flowing wave patterns, and then create a loft and use some sub D tricks to get soft edges. You'll also see how to control the shape, spacing, and amplitude of the waves in real time. At the end, we'll look at a quick way to render our design. All right, let's start from scratch. I've opened a new Grasshopper document and we'll begin right here. I'm going to search for a component called range. This gives me a range of numbers based on a domain and a step count. I'm going to feed these numbers into a unit Z vector and this vector can be directly converted into points. We can control the height of these points based on the domain. I'm planning for a 30 centimeter high lamp, so let's set the domain value to 30. And here, with the step count, we can control how many points we need. I'm gonna leave this at 15 steps for now. All right, on top of these points, we're going to create a circle. I'll search for circle and use the points as the plane input. Grasshopper will automatically convert the points into XY planes and create a circle on each one. Now, for the radius, we want each circle to have a different radius to form that curved lamp shape. To control this, I'll use a graph mapper. The default graph mapper takes values from zero to one and remaps them based on the shape of a curve. I'm going to copy and reuse the previous range component. This time, I'll leave the domain input empty. For the graph type, I'll right click and choose Bezier. Now, if I double click the graph mapper, we can control the minimum and maximum output domain. For the Y axis, which will define our radius, I'll set the start to 1.4 and the end to 23. That gives us the minimum and maximum radius. Now, by playing around with the graph, we can shape it the way we want. All right. So we have our base form. On top of these circles, we're going to create our wave-like louver pattern. We're going to take those circles and simplify them into polylines by rebuilding the curves. For the degree, I'm going to set it to one that'll give us a simple polyline. With the count input, we control how many segments each circle has. Let's start with something like 13. Now we need each of those small segments separately. So we use the explode component to break each polyline into its individual line segments. Here, the exploded curves are just in a horizontal order. We're gonna use flip matrix here. This is a data tree operation that will reorganize our list of segments from rows into columns. So first, we're gonna evaluate a point on this curve. At the same time, we're reparameterizing it. Now, if we just use a number slider from zero to one, zero gives us a point at the start and one gives us a point at the end. But we don't want them just straight. We want these points to form a wave. So what I'm gonna do is go back here and copy this range value. And we're gonna read our control source using a sign function. So we have a number and we're gonna pass it into the sign function. This one is gonna go into the graph mapper again. For the graph type, I'm gonna choose linear. That's gonna help me taper it off and also control the input and output domains. Since the sign function output goes from negative one to one, I'm gonna set the X domain from negative one to one. For the output, we want it to match our curve domain. So I'm gonna set it from zero to one. We can use this directly for our parameter. Now you can start to see these points forming a wave-like shape. To see it better, I'm gonna use a NURBS curve to connect the points. Now you can kind of see the pattern coming together. Using the domain we set for our range, we can control how many cycles we want. Let's say I set one complete cycle, which is basically two pi, that means one full wave. Here, I'm using pi to define the cycle. You can control this by increasing or decreasing the cycle count. So now I wanna make all those waves flow in a certain direction, and I wanna alternate the direction on each curve. So here, what I'm gonna do is shatter the curve into two pieces. I'll also reparameterize it. And for the parameter, I'm gonna set 0.5. That's gonna split the curve right at the midpoint into two. Let's start by choosing one of them. I'm gonna use a list item. Since the shatter created some extra branches, 
I'm going to use trim tree to match it back to the previous data structure. And we're going to use this directly on our evaluate curve. Now you can see the waves showing up only on half of the segment. Let's apply the same process, but this time for the second half. So I'll just add an additional output for our list item and that's going to give us the second half curve. I'm going to use the previous evaluate curve and NURBS curve setup, but in between we need to flip the direction. One way to do that is simply by using flip curve. If the curve is flipped, then the direction is flipped too, and that gives us a reverse wave. Now you can see we're getting this kind of alternating pattern, and of course we can control how many cycles we want, but you'll notice there are some gaps, it looks like we don't have enough resolution. To fix that, you can go back to the start of the script where we have the domain step control. That basically gives you more resolution and makes the wave tighter. Also, here in the graph, you can control the spacing between the waves. If you want to increase the gap between consecutive waves, just push up the graph mapper. We have two directional waves that are opposite each other but I want to add one more extra wave in between each consecutive wave, which goes in and out instead of just left to right. This rebuild count controls how many segments we have right now, and we need about twice as many. I'm going to use divide curve and also use the same count. But here in the expression, I'm going to add x times two. That basically gives us twice the divisions. Now you can see those point rows lying exactly in between each consecutive wave. We're going to apply the same flip matrix as before, and we're going to make those points move in and out. So for this, we're going to use the previous setup, like the sine function and the graph mapper. To make the points move in and out, we can just use scale non-uniform. Since this is already at the world origin, using both x and y scaling factors, we can force them to move in and out. All right, the effect is a bit too strong, so I'm going to taper the graph, moving it up a little to reduce the influence. Now we can see the points following a web-like shape, and I'm going to use the previous NURBS curve to connect them up. All right, now we can see our waves, but here we can notice that the new wave we created has the same phase as the previous one. So let's shift it a little bit. Instead of using sine, we're going to replace it with a cosine function. That's going to shift it a little by one quarter of a cycle. All right, so now we have three curves, left, right, and middle. We're going to combine all three and create a loft to make up our form. But first, let's take a look at how we can combine them. I'm going to use the wave component. The first one goes into the first input, the second one, and for the third one, I'm going to add an extra input and connect it right here. Okay, now we have our three curves connected into inputs 0, 1, and 2. We want to make sure they keep the right order. So let's start from this curve. This one is already connected to input 0. The next one should be the middle curve, which is connected to input 2. Then this wave that's flipped is already connected to input 1. From there, we need to continue the pattern. After input one, we go back to the middle curve again, which is input two, and this sequence keeps repeating. So in a panel, I'm gonna write it like this, zero for the first curve, two for the middle curve, one for the flipped wave, and then back to two for the middle curve again. I'm also gonna right click the panel and uncheck multiline data. So each value stays as its own item and make sure to flatten each input so the weaving happens across the entire set. All right, now we can just go ahead and loft it. So I'm gonna bring in a loft component. For the loft option, I'll choose straight loft so we can really see the hard edges of the pattern. To visualize it better, I'll use a custom preview. And for the material, I'll keep it simple, it's just a generic white material using a color swatch. Now, if you switch to rendered mode, you'll notice the middle curve looks slightly shifted. That's why we get this strange overlap. To fix it, I'll go back to that curve, flatten it, and then use a shift list. By default, it shifts forward by one, and that takes care of the issue. Now, you can clearly see the pattern, but the lofted surface still looks a bit jagged. 
my plan is to convert this into sub-D geometry and then add a slight bevel along each edge. So I'm going to start with mesh loft here. This one comes from the Chromodorus plugin, so you'll need to have it installed. It gives me a warning. The input curve must be a polyline, of course. So here we could, here, instead of using the NURBS curve component, we could use polyline before. Or from the output, I can extract the control points using control points. And then I'm going to recreate it back as a polyline. Now we can flatten this and fit it into our mesh loft. Now we get our mesh loft result, which can be directly converted into sub D by simply passing it into a sub D container. You can kind of see there is too much smoothing applied in this geometry. I just want a small bevel instead of the whole thing becoming a blobby result. So let me show you what I could do manually. In Rhino, if we do this manually, we could select all the vertical edges like here. I'm going to use cell edge ring and select every vertical edge. Then just add a tiny bevel here, right? Now, if we go back to rendered mode, we can see beautiful results. This is before and this is after. So now let's do this in Grasshopper. Basically what we need to do is add a few segments in the horizontal curves. Let's do that in Grasshopper. So here, those polylines are the ones creating our loft, right? They're vertical right now. Let's turn them into horizontal rings first. I'll add a flip matrix here that just flips them into horizontal. In each polyline segment, we need a tiny gap that's gonna act as a bevel. So I'll explode the polyline to get each segment and then use extend curve. If I set the start and end values to a negative number, it makes that gap. I'll just set a very tiny negative value for both start and end. If you get an error, you just need to reduce the value. Now we can see there is a tiny gap here. Now let's connect all the curves back together. I'll extract the control points. And since there are two points per branch, I'll use trim tree to put them into the previous structure. Then create a polyline back. You may ask, there is no difference, but basically we just added extra segments. Now, when this passes to mesh loft, it counts as holding edges, like a bevel. All right, now this gives us a tight, soft edge. Here's the before, and here's the after, okay? So basically, that's it. Now let me show you some of the controls you can use. At the start of the script, using this graph mapper, you can control the shape. It's really fast. You can just watch in real time and move things around. You also have control over how many cycles you want. You can increase the scale to get more cycles or reduce it to have fewer cycles. Another control is this graph mapper. This basically controls the gap between consecutive waves. You can push it up or down to reduce or increase the gap. Then there's another control that determines how many segments we have between points, which also affects how many waves we have horizontally. Now we can play with all these controls. This operational class script and all the final variations I used will be available on Patreon. I also made some modifications to the base to avoid it being flat. For the render you see in the intro, I basically made some small variations and then took a screenshot from Rhino. Then, over in Google AI Studio, using Nano Banana, I just sent the screenshot and also added a description in the prompt. You can copy my prompt if you want. Basically, I'm just explaining something like a photorealistic render of a pendant lamp based on my reference image. Here are some of the results I got. This one, and also this one. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.